Okay. Welcome everybody. May I ask everybody to mute your audio also until, and then uh, ask your questions in the chat. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Jeannie Edmonds. I'm the Chief Operating Officer, Chief Operating Officer for Next Tribe. And Jeannie Ralston is the founder and the CEO of Next Tribe. She's not here today, so I am filling in for her with Shelly Ross. Shelly Ross, Shelly, I, I just want you to see that I'm drinking from my Wonder Woman glass today in your honor, because you are the Wonder Woman. You are amazing. I have known Shelly, full disclosure, since 1981, uh, Shelly, you can unmute yourself so you can engage with this if you'd like. Um, so I've known Shelly since 1981. We worked together at NBC in New York. She was a badass. Even before that, she was a total badass. Um, she was, she went to University of Miami. She was an early reporter and editor for the National Enquirer. Imagine sitting next to her at a dinner party. And she has so many more stories than that. She went way beyond the National Enquirer, zoomed up. Nobody ever gave her, by the way, a hand up. Maybe she'll say that a mentor helped her from time to time. But Shelly was not born with a silver spoon in her mouth. Shelly worked hard for everything that she ever got in life. So she moved on from the Tomorrow Show. She did a bunch of other TV shows and she's exec produced a lot of things. And then she was executive producer of Good Morning America executive producer of the, was it called the early show back then at CBS? Yes. And <laughs> yes, it was. It went, and it was very early. She had to get up at three o'clock in the morning to be driven into town. And, uh, and now she's doing other television projects, but she's moved beyond television into medicine in a very big way. She's involved with an organization called the Cure Alliance. And I'll let her tell you what the Cure Alliance is all about. And then we want to go back through, if you don't mind, Shelly, just give us a brief introduction to Cure Alliance. Brief. And then yeah. we'll go back through the television career because I'm sure people have questions about that. The Cure Alliance is a nonprofit organization of about 300 <clears throat> really genius, global geniuses in uh, scientific research. They're surgeons, they're head of the Diabetes Research Institute, they're the real deal. And we formed this organization over 10 years ago, realizing that we don't cure diseases anymore. We just treat them into awful, uh, ends of longevity. So um, we decided we we put together a, a plan of how we can break down the barriers because it, to get a new drug to market to cure a disease, it's like 14 years and $8 billion. And uh, scientists call that crossing Death Valley. Once you prove something, have proof of performance in a lab, that's just the beginning of the nightmare. So we identified all these element barriers to tear down. And the most obvious one was sharing of knowledge. So we start, our, our scientists started immediately sharing knowledge and Skyping this is 10 years ago, Skyping into each other's operating theaters. And we're talking about in China, in Karolinska Institute, and all over the world, the top, MD Anderson. Um, and that pushed a fast forward button on knowledge. Uh, I'll give you a, a, the shorter, but... Um, we were from all disciplines and getting uh, policy changes. <clears throat> when along came COVID and suddenly our diabetes expert, our pulmonary expert, everybody to a person did a 24 seven pivot to COVID. And uh, we came up with a, they came up 16 doctors collaborating and sharing knowledge, came up with a, a, a new medicine and a safe and effective medicine for the most severe 
uh, cases of lung injury and COVID. And that was a tremendous success. But my gang still wants to go back and cure pancreatic cancer and diabetes. So they passed that work along. They saved lives. They put it up for free for anybody to, to you know, take it. Uh, they don't want to sell to pharmaceutical companies because the, these guys just want to save lives. They don't want to get rich. So that's my wonderful gang. And, it's and very, very exciting, Shelly. And, you know, it feels like it, just because, you know, COVID is resurging in some parts of the country, we ought to stick with this for a little minute and then we'll get back, I promise, to the entertainment and the juicy stuff and the news business mm. and everything, because there's a lot of stuff to say about that. But I think sticking with this for just a minute, since there is this resurgence going yes. on. Um, so tell me uh, how you even got to go back to the story about when you were on the Hill pushing for cures you were you had your hearing on the hill where you were testifying and pushing for cures and then that sort of drove this didn't it well it really started you know we had this this 10 point you know if we could sit down at the time with barack obama and have him sign 10 executive orders we could accelerate cures uh, one, one of the amazing easy things is we've got to just redo our patent law. You know, we have a doctor, a scientist who was curing pancreatic, they were human cancer tumors in mice, pancreatic tumors. And he found a way uh, he, he found a mechanism to turn off the switch. And it was just an amazing breakthrough. And, um, but he ran into somebody else's patent. He ran into a guy who got an overreaching global patent on, you know, uh, this process of turning off a protein in nematode worms in Germany. But he knew that what he had was discovered an element of basic science. I, I wanna tell, this is, I, I know this is gonna sound off point. It's a fascinating science story. It's how discovery happens. Two Americans, about 15 or 20 years ago, won a, a, the Nobel Prize in Science. They were biologists, botanists, and they were tweaking with RNA so they could make purple petunias more purple. And they were tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. And they came out, their batch of petunias was white. The batch of petunias had no color. And for years, this was like a mystery of science until these two guys came along and realized what they had done. They had turned off the RNA. They had interfered with the RNA. RNA interference, RNA I. And they got the Nobel Prize in Science because it's, it's the blueprint of life. And the Nobel committee knew that it had tremendous implications. They didn't go out and patent anything. They just like, this is for the world to know. Like the universe, you know, with a new telescope belongs to everybody. But there was a guy in, in in Germany, and he took these nematode worms that were twitching, they had something wrong with them. And he applied DNA, RNA interference, and they stopped twitching. And that's what 
he, he was the first, a nematode worm is a mammal. So he was the first to apply this purple petunia science to a mammal. And he got a worldwide patent for any use of RNA interference forever after. This should be against the law. It's not moral. He's not going to go out and use it to cure every disease. No, he moved to New York, set up a company on the New York Stock Exchange, and he serves as a toll booth for discovery. So my guy at Baylor College, he was the chair of, of surgery. He uses this RNA interference to turn off the protein that shuts down, to shut down pancreatic cancer, which we all know is a, a very fast killer. And it shuts it off fast enough. And, and how can he, he do it without skirting that guy's patent? You can't, he couldn't. So he so, had to, so he had to figure out, okay, I, I got lost a minute. So there's this guy with his patent. Well, no, lives so, in so, at, um, uh, so Baylor College decided to stop funding his research because they were never going to make money. Oh. He just wanted to cure pancreatic cancer. Oh, God. So there's no academic support. There's no, you know, he already, you know, had NIH um, funding and he left Baylor because they wouldn't support the continuing research. He had already done it, you know, on mice on cell lines, mice with human tumors, and five pigs, long, you know, long term. And he was curing tumor-based pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. So he's left and he does, I'll, I'll tell you later about a fascinating, he didn't give up trying to cure pancreatic cancer. He just gave up that technique. He then started from scratch, but he had the science and he knew he had isolated the protein that overexpresses itself in pancreatic cancer, PDX1. Mm -hmm. So now he just went through a year of computer searches to find all all um, authorized FDA approved drugs that would have some impact on PDX1. So he narrowed that down. And so he, his research is not lost and he is about to go into phase three trial. That'll be my next round of fundraising, but it's thrilling. And I will tell you that he is FDA authorized for a clinical trial on pancreatic cancer only, but he knows from his lab that this technology works on all solid tumors. Wow. So behind, right behind, once he does the, the pancreatic tumor um, clinical trial, and if he gets the results he's expecting, right behind that is geoblastoma. Wow. And Jeannie, you yeah. know that. And right behind that is triple negative breast tumors, which has no, you know, known treatment. So he, he anyway, these are rock stars. These are and I'll get back to, to, I'll now move back to morning television. I never thought that I would find um, an outlet, a pursuit that was as exciting as, as morning television and network news. I never thought 
that what could be more exciting than, you know, getting the, the first phone call, you know, getting all the calls before you meet, uh, you know, before the, the, the press, because I am the press, you know, you're on the front line and your reporters are on the police radio. Your hey, Shelley, reporters you, are- yeah, I, I'm sorry. You were in the control room during 9-11 for Good Morning America, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You covered the OJ trial, Primetime Live. I you, know I was in charge of the OJ Simpson trial for ABC News. I meant for ABC News, sorry. And oh, then you did the Menendez murders. And the Menendez you, murder. Um, but it was, it was so much, you know, we put bad doctor. We, it was a different. It, tale it was, that was yours too, wasn't it? I did um, five Pentagon exposés and changed policy, uh, rape policy in the Navy. And uh, we instituted the first anti-hazing policy in the Marine Corps. We had these tapes of, of these Marine Corps that, that the guys who made the drill team and they had to go out in the desert and try out for five months in the Arizona desert. And the day that they tried, began their tryout, the upper classmen, so to speak, would take these vats of urine and feces and dead rats and God knows what else, and bury them in the desert, in the Arizona desert. And then came time to say congratulations. And you know what the silent drill team is. It's the most disciplined. It's they have the the guns, but- Yeah, and they don't make any sound. Yeah, right. Yeah, they just count in their minds. It is so disciplined. It is so difficult. And these young kids are so proud. You know, it's a ceremonial unit. And they're so proud when they make this unit because they played before presidents and heads of state. And and, uh, and I was tipped off and given videos. Somebody foolishly videotaped it of the hazing ceremony where these guys who made the team were stripped naked, their hands and feet feet tied with duct tape. They had their genitals painted with black shoe polish, which was not, uh, you couldn't wash it off and it was toxic. So they would this screaming from the burning and as they ran down to the ship they had to run through a gauntlet of upperclassmen all wearing full gas masks oh. because what they were throw this foul whatever whatever they were throwing on them was foul and the blood curling screams, and not only that, was I given these videotapes, but at the end, as they went down the hall, one peeked into a room and asked like, what do you think this year? And it's the commanders in there. You know, it's the, and the guys with the, you know, well, metal. you've always been a champion for justice. And, and, you know, maybe that's why you got into journalism in the first place. Um, but as a defender of women, um, do you mind if I bring up your New York Times art op-ed? No, well, I will also say my defender of women, which, start, which was all these Pentagon exposés, yeah. sexual harassment, how they mistreated rape and instead of prosecuting rape they sort of sent the girls home to their parents and all this they they had a questionnaire that we got rid of that was nicknamed were you really raped the first question 
when you're filing a rape report was, have you ever had financial difficulty? Are you serious? No, it was wow. that bad and that obvious. So I went to work for all of that. And then I came across the silent drill team story. They came to me. And even Sam Donaldson and, and Rick Kaplan said, oh, I've been through fraternity hazing and there's some bond, you know, male bonding that takes place that you wouldn't understand. Yeah. And I just said, I, I don't care. This is not putting your hand in a bag of chicken livers and yeah. being told you're in the graveyard. Yeah. You know, this is not fraternity hazing. Yeah. I would have to say that every single person who serves in our military has the right not to have his or her genitals or body parts touched unwantedly. Right, yeah. Oh, and, right. and that was how I felt. Interesting. And, and I, and these two guys were, you know, whistleblowers as we know. I mean, they were like, it was so sad because they, they were kicked out. Um, they weren't team players, but they had their genitals painted with toxic shoe polish that, you know, it's a carcinogen. Anyway, um, I really, I did the first sexual harassment stories at ABC News after Anita Hill. I go, I go back a long time. Um, and but then you've been I, a whistleblower it, too, Shelley. Right. And, uh, and I, honestly, for 40 years, I did, you know, um, female advocacy, gender advocacy. And I just got so fed up and fatigued when this latest round came about. I thought I had fought these battles, exposed people, and now we have Matt Lauer and Harvey Weinstein. And, and then I knew I also, I couldn't stand the time's up you know, then Hollywood takes over. Yeah. And it's like, uh, you know, I know how this is going to end. I, I actually volunteered my services and didn't hear back. And I had some solutions, but, you know, they were too busy, you know, making their uh, Netflix deals after, yeah. after uh, board meetings. And I was just really, really fed up. And uh, I had been sexually harassed physically, really only a couple times in my career. And they were pretty egregious. Um, and I wrote about both of them, but the, uh, I don't know which, which one you want me to concentrate on. Oh, I, I don't care. I just think the fact that you have blown the whistle on a couple of people, a couple of high ranking people. Oh. Well, the first one I published was when Jeannie and I were working together, Jeannie didn't know that our, our executive producer was Roger Ailes. Yes, the Roger Ailes, but 40 plus years ago, Roger Ailes. And uh, a little less powerful, a little less polished. And in my job interview, Roger had offered me the job. And then um, called back for a second lunch and uh, began the lunch by saying, so tell me, when did you first discover you were sexy? And I was just so embarrassed. I remember like looking at my feet and I said, 
Roger, I'm finding this very embarrassing. That is usually a signal, like I'm not playing this game. You know, we're not having a secret language of twin, but he was unrelenting and uh, wound up explaining that he was looking for a sexual alliance with me and that this would help both our careers. And at the end of the lunch, uh, I said, I, I could never like date a boss. I called it dating. And he said, well, I'm looking for a sexual alliance. Think about it. And then, because I'm, and he withdrew the job offer, leaving me no chance, no other option but to go to the lawyer who was looking at the contract. And uh, anyway, my lawyer called NBC. It was a big, this is in 1981. It's a, it was a big deal, but in nine, it was huge, but in 1981, everybody, including the people on my side, just wanted it to go away. They, uh, they all did business together. My lawyer did business with NBC regularly. They called, there was Tom Snyder's lawyer. There was the NBC lawyer, uh, my lawyer, and Roger Ailes. And it would have, they looked at it and it would have scandalized the show and Tom Snyder, not Roger Ailes. And it would have scandalized me as a troublemaker and somebody, the one good thing is Roger Ailes never denied it. He, the, the opening conversation was, um, Roger, I, I think we have a boy-girl problem here today. And he said, what are you talking about? And the lawyer said, Shelly Ross. And he said, hey guys, I'm single. Oh my God. He never denied it. He thought I'm it was sure okay. everybody on this call has had some kind of harassment story. That was yeah, a good yeah, one. And yeah. the fact that everybody. I never learned about that until 20 years later, I didn't even, until you wrote about it, actually. Um, were, you, were you, did you write about it before Gretchen Carlson or right when the Gretchen Carlson thing happened? About the same time. This is what. This By is the way, if anybody has a question, please put it in the chat and I'll ask you. Go ahead. Okay. So. What happened? I knew Roger was was a, a pig and a, a, just a different era. And I knew that this was like what women were navigating and, you know, coming out of university in, in our 20s, that we yeah. were all navigating it. And and I thought that there was a way to navigate it. If it happened other times, it did happen other times. And I was able to say, uh, oh, you, you have such a beautiful wife at home. Just go in the bathroom and throw some cold water on your face and come back to the edit session. You know, it was always like, is there something happening? No. No, it's just late at night and we're tired. Just like, uh, you know, you could do that and and they'd be a little bad, you know? So I don't call that harassment. It's the unrelenting. Yeah. So, but what happened was in this lawyer's conference call, I was flown to, to New York first class where Roger Ailes, I'm sure was told to and knew it was wise to, fell on his sword, apologized to me. Didn't put any blame on me, didn't discuss how I was just said, 
I'm so sorry. This must be middle age craziness. Mm. I don't know. I was like, thought I was besotted with you. And he just did the, the most appropriate apology and then said, please come to work for me. You're still the most qualified person for the job. I still see flashes of brilliance and you'll never have this problem with me or anybody else on this show again. You can go someplace else. And so, and it was in the middle of a writer's guild strike out here. So I took the job. I felt I forgave him. I wouldn't have gone to work there if I was going to like scheme and get back at him. Yeah. I forgave him and I thought smugly, this is how we do it. We teach him one. We teach him. Time. Yeah. <laughs> and I was so excited. Uh-huh. And, uh, and then we, uh, Roger Ailes wrote a marketing book and he wrote about me and my flashes of brilliance in the marketing book. And then a few years later, we, he would call me once in a while, ask me what I'm working on, but just like no different than any other boss, but I knew he just wanted to see if we were all right. Mm-hmm. You know, if I had whatever turned and I just had, now fast forward to, uh, I'm at EP of Good Morning America. Roger Ailes is chairman of Fox and Good Housekeeping throws a luncheon for Laura Bush for captains of industry. And the amazing thing is Roger Ailes and I are at the head table with Mark Whitaker, who was then editor of Newsweek. And I forget, but it's a, there's like six of us and Laura Bush. And there is in, Roger and I, all those years later. And he kept saying, I am so proud of you, what you've accomplished. And I said, well, you're ruling the world. And we reconnected. And Roger invited me to lunch at at Fox in his private dining room. And we would have lunch. He was very amusing in his own, like, I always used to say, you know, I knew he had, you know, all the legs he showed and all the things, but there were things I liked that he did. I said, you are like delivering news, like somebody pulled their bar stool up. I also couldn't believe all the, you know, in network news, you had to have a pristine screen. He had all this information all over the screen. Uh And I said, I think that's brilliant. I mean, people need, you know, we're in the information age. And and eventually, I was the first show at ABC in talking to the ABC news president to say, let's start with a crawl. Let's put the weather, we had the weather, let, on the West Coast, let's put the stock market ticker. Let's get people to, you know. Mm. So I, you know. Because we were I'm, just transitioning to the digital age, right? And during yeah, that time, yeah, yeah. You know, everybody was going to internet and all that stuff. And then Roger had a son. I always joked I wished he had a daughter. Mm. But his... Um, his, he always used to talk to me about, I don't know how many more years I'm going to work. And I, it's all contrived. How many more years I'm going to work at this pace? You know, my, it got to my son has, you know, four more years of high school and I'm going to miss them. 
and then he's off. And I just looked at him and I said, I don't think you have to like retire. I don't think your son needs Mr. Mom. I think your son needs a dad with an important job who's around more. Mm -hmm. We had all these like great conversations. So I was quite shocked. I thought I had fixed Roger Ailes, even though I knew he was sexist. Yeah. Um, with, you know, with the way, with the women he chose to be on camera. But I- So, so in case anybody's wondering uh, about that morning show, you know, the morning show on Apple TV, if anybody's seen it, how realistic is that in terms of, you know, there's the Matt Lauer type character with the sexual harassment thing. How realistic does that feel to you? Because when I was at a morning show, I was a lowly producer. You were the executive producer. So you were dealing with all those guys upstairs in suits, in addition oh, to the multi-million dollar me, talent, talent, talent. Yeah. Let me just tell you that... Um, Matt Lauer, the morning show on Apple or wherever it's, is almost verbatim what Matt Lauer did. I thought it looked really close to everything I read about it. Yeah. Oh, no, wow. it's everything that's been proved. Wow. I mean, I was so shocked, but not shocked about Matt Lauer, but, and they all knew. That's why yeah. I, I yeah. can say that they all know. And isn't that generally the case for having dealt with talent at the level that you were dealing with all the big name talent? No, they're paying I, I them up. Aren't they covering for them constantly though? Yes, mm -hmm. but um, Peter Jennings had quite a reputation of being a ladies man. Here's the big difference. All these other, all these other, Matt Lauer, Roger Ailes, there is a hostility and a power trip. There is something unhealthy, unholy, immoral, disgusting, vulgar about what they do and who they do it with. Peter Jennings, loved women, he loved people. And he didn't, now, yes, he did marry somebody who worked at ABC, but his, his dalliances were with movie stars. And the, I remember finding out he, what's her name? Hannah Nishwara. There was a, an Arab professor who was on ABC all the time as an older woman. And Peter, when he lived in, in the Middle East, had some tarred affair with, with she's an intellectual. Yeah. You know, I would admire the people that I know that Peter, you know, had flings with, had long, meaningful relationships with, and who he married. I mean, these are, these. So there are degrees of difference in men when they do there this. Is, they, there is yeah. peers. Yeah. There's, there's no. It's, yeah, totally um, different, yeah inequality in power. There's no coercing somebody. Yeah. You know, they were his intellectual peer, which isn't easy. So that's different. I put Peter in different a different way. league completely. We, we don't have much time left. And I do want to ask you about aging boldly. Um, this is our tagline for Next Tribe. We are women over 45 who like to travel. 
We like to go to virtual events and live events. Um, we uh, have this online magazine where we have a lot of, you know, some well-known writers. Sheila Weller, you know Sheila Weller, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, well-known writers writing for us. Uh, Barbara Lippert, she's writing uh, weekly columns for us. So um, you have, in my eyes, as somebody who's looked at the trajectory of your career, it seems that moving from television into medicine was a natural progression, except, oh, I did forgot to mention, Shelley's a best-selling author of two books, Fall from Grace, uh, Sex, Scandal, and Corruption in American Politics from 1702 to the Present, and Scruffy, this adorable <laughs> book about the pooches of the pandemic and how we gave them the world's worst haircuts. You have, to, you have to open up the pages, right? None of the groomers were available. So we did lots of stuff to our pooches, but it's really a tender, sweet book. And it's a fundraiser for the Cure Alliance. Um, there's a uh, link to it in the, in the chat if, you, if you're interested. Um, so she did these two best best selling books, and uh, I also wrote a third book. The third book, I was going to say, you you wrote a book about MS for yeah. MS patients, um, and I think that I've always called you Doctor Ross, you know. So you've always had a keen interest in medicine. You did I write do. the book about MS, but so it's your passion, and you're bringing that energy of all that morning television, all the bullshit you put up with in your career all of the, the uh, fighting for the right thing. You know, you're a justice warrior in medicine, I would say. That's what you are, Wonder Woman in medicine. Oh, well, um, I do think I, the Cure Alliance, this is a fabulous segue for your gang. We, we rewrote our mission statement at the start of COVID. We knew that would be a few years. We are in the process of rewriting our mission statement because an amazing, amazing thing happened during COVID. All the science uh, that my gang had been working on has intersected in the last three years with the science of longevity. Yeah. So what is protecting people from and shoring up their immune systems, which is, you know, your immune system is diabetes and arthritis and lupus and everything. Every, every modern disease has an immune system base, cancer. Um, all the, the scientists for 20 years, starting with a, a genius named David Sinclair, who's at Harvard, in charge of the Harvard genome. And he's been working on all these, finding pathways to keep, you know, anti-aging. And it's all in your DNA, keeping your DNA pathways open and healthy, um, he says the person who will live to 150 has already been born. But the whole key is you don't want to live to 150 with a terrible disease. Yeah. You want to live to 150 healthy with no disease. So there are certain supplements and they're all plant extracts. And there's one, I have no financial interest in this, but I will tell you about this one called CERT 500 plus. I get it from Italy. It's a, it, it was developed as a longevity supplement, but they did two, my guys did two university stu separate studies in vitro and discovered that the CERT 500 plus compound um, will not attach to COVID-19 or influenza uh, flu A. So these longevity drugs 
uh, supplements, why some of them wind up being your immune system protection. So I am watching, I, I'm also on all these like financial threads and I am literally watching hundreds of millions and billions of hedge fund dollars and the Saudi, the Saudis pledged a billion dollars a year to study um, longevity. Wow. It, it's the science is here. It's and it's interesting in the that the longevity science and the cure science are following a parallel path. No, the longevity and the prevention. Oh, the prevention, I see. It's okay. longevity is the prevention. We are still going to try to, you know, there's still going to be generations that are getting diseases. But starting now, I take these supplements. I do everything. You know, um, you know, I'm, okay, let me see. I'm pretty fit. You are right? very fit. Uh, my hair is thick again. Yeah. My skin is not, is pretty good. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm going to be 70. Yep. And I jump around on a trampoline and, and I, I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't born this way. <laughs> Let me just say it. I, I went through, <laughs> I wasn't born like a natural athlete. Yeah. And I wasn't, uh, and you know, I had a few really sick years. Yes. You know, where I had cancer surgeries and chemo and 10 surgeries and back surgeries and front surgeries and you name it. Um, I had so many, the last laparoscopic surgery I had was an emergency appendectomy and my doctor was so pleased with himself. He said, oh, I went in right where you're your other doctors went, your other, your last doctor went in. Now you mean the last two doctors went in. <laughs> Jesus. You're, you're number three on a belly button. Oh. And uh, I came out and he was the cutest doctor. And I came out with two belly buttons. But so I wasn't always like fit. And, you know, I've had, uh, multiple tears in both rotator cuffs. I, I was really at one point disabled. Mm -hmm. So I really believe um, if anybody wants to contact me privately, I can give you a, as much as you want to read. I am up every night reading about the science of longevity. It is exploding every day. And here's the exciting part. It's not just this, this, you know, the father of all of this information is this David Sinclair. He has a podcast, by the way. Dave, you should probably maybe get him on your show to talk yeah, about yeah, good. vitality. Anyway, he has a, uh, he's the father of all the longevity science. But now he's had all these students that who broke, you know, from Harvard and went off and did their own studies. He identified one, basically one pathway to longevity. If you can keep the sirtuin pathway clear, then you're going to be healthy and well. Yeah. Wow. These guys have identified other pathways, which is so exciting because it means you don't have to keep all the pathway clears, pathways clear. You just have to keep one. Yeah, yeah. So, so Shelly, Shelly, we are out of time. You have one more, you have another, you wanna conclude with something here about? About no. what you were saying. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but we we're getting short. No, it's just very, 
it's very exciting. It's I stay up all night and read as much as I can. And then the last thing I always read is one of the big keys to longevity is sleeping well. Yeah. And now it, and every night it's four o'clock in the morning and I go, well, I, I F that one up again. <laughs> That's too excited reading. <laughs> well, Shelly, you, you're such an inspiration. I, such a powerful woman uh, and a passionate defender of all of us who are out here trying to find cures and not just pills to take daily for chronic disease, looking for actual cures, things like diabetes. We're getting closer. I know because of the work of the Cure Alliance, breast cancer, all of these other things. And oh, Shelly, I'm- still, We're still, unfortunately, we're years and years away. And I will tell you, I hope that next generation looks back at what I and my sister survivors went through. It's barbaric. It's totally barbaric. It's unacceptable. But now we're going to pivot to prevention. You don't have to get I, I'm telling you, you don't have to get COVID. You don't have to get these, you know, you don't have to get cancer. There's, um, we're, we're right there at the door of that. We're still a few years away. A few years away. On, uh, we have had a question I'm about curing, do you have any I'm curing. I'm curing. So we did have a question. Do you have any information on overcoming diabetes? a book about um anything you could recommend there's no one book uh what age what type diabetes elizabeth oh, what type two type two okay mm -hmm. type two i'm not as familiar with um but i i think and uh it, does that involve insulin? No. Okay, so type two, you don't, my husband had type two that developed into type one. Um, and you just have to, it's really hard. It's just really hard, but you have to under, the key thing is to understand that sugar isn't just sugar. Bread is sugar. You've got to count carbs. You got to keep a journal. Um, oh, here's a big one. Here, here's a, a, talk to your doctor. I'm not a doctor. I just happened to talk no. almost okay. to the head of the Diabetes Institute in my research institute. You want to take omega-3 and vitamin D in high doses, but not toxic doses every day. So I want you to take omega-3 from the website RxZone. Okay. And they have micro capsules. I take it. Um, I take four in the morning and four at night. They're tiny, you know, they're not the, at, you don't want to get fish oil that's over the counter because fish oil, you know, that's unregulated. This is pharmaceutical grade. Okay. Even though you can just buy it without a prescription, the ones you buy in CVS, they're full of mercury and whatever heavy metals they're fishing out of the waters now. Diane, it looks and, like you had a question. And D3, you want okay. to take about 4,000 units a day. And that will tamp down the inflammation. Read up on Zone RX. And if you want more information uh, and really just be strict with your carbs. 
And, you know, if you screw up, the Mediterranean diet is really good. Glad that Paris trip is behind you, Elizabeth. Good, because that was total bread. I'm sure total, it was pastry. Total yeah. pastry. No, yeah. but there, there is, there's a lot that you can do to get in better health. There's a okay. lot. My husband has diabetes. I know how hard it is. And uh, I know you just sometimes throw in the towel and tomorrow's the new day. Keep a journal. Thank you so much, Shelley. Really appreciate you. your time today. You're really so inspiring. You are the apotheosis of a bold, brave woman who is aging boldly. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Thank you for appreciate listening. It. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.